Okay, so let's get going um, with a little bit of motivation. So you can study primes in short intervals. And of course, the Riemann hypothesis allows you to count primes very accurately. Okay, so we have this, uh, this Chebyshev function, uh, the psi of x. So this is the summatory function of the von Mongold. I'm gonna sum this up to x. And we have a main term of size x and then a very good error term under the Riemann hypothesis. This will give you an error term, essentially the size the square root of x, maybe times a couple of logarithmic factors. Okay, so if I have some sort of really nice uh, expression for the counting function of the primes like this, then this would let me count primes in short intervals. I could take this expression at x plus y, take the expression at x and subtract the two of them. And as long as y is a little bit bigger than x to the one half, this would actually give me an asymptotic formula. Okay, so I could get an asymptotic formula for primes in an interval just a little bit larger than the square root of x. And this gets pretty close to a conjecture of which there's a serial conjecture that between any two consecutive squares, n squared and n plus one squared, that there should be a prime. So it's not quite there, but it's getting very close to this. Okay, uh, so the Riemann hypothesis is, of course, a very strong assumption. And if I was really interested just in counting primes in short intervals, I maybe don't need something quite as strong as the Riemann hypothesis. The Riemann hypothesis says that all of the primes, or sorry, all of the zeros are on the critical line. And maybe I actually don't need to know that all of the zeros are on the critical line, but just that most of them are sort of close to the critical line, or that there aren't that many zeros that are far away from the critical line. And if I knew something about this, then maybe I could still get results in primes and short intervals. Okay, so this leads directly to the idea of a zero density estimate, looking at how many zeros I can have far away from the critical line. So the usual thing to define here is this n sigma t. So sigma will be something between one half and one. And I'm gonna be counting zeros in a rectangle. So I want zeros to have a real part, at least sigma, so to the right of sigma, and then looking at them in height uh, up to capital T. So it's a very skinny, very tall rectangle. And I want to count zeros in rectangles like this. Um, the Riemann hypothesis will tell you that there are no zeros here, right? If sigma is greater than a half. Um, so maybe this is just some fancy complicated way of talking about uh, the empty set and these zeros, you know, we think they don't actually exist, uh, but for our purposes, we're gonna sort of pretend that they do exist and see what sort of things happen. Okay, see what sort of things could happen if we did have zeros uh, that sort of lived off of the critical line. Okay, so we don't need a bound as good as there are no zeros in this rectangle. That's the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, but we, do, we would need something non-trivial, better than saying, you know, all of the zeros could live in this rectangle. And the, the sorts of bounds that you can prove for n sigma t look like this. So I have t to a power, a times one minus sigma, maybe with some little loss here, little low one. Okay, so A will be a constant and smaller is better. And this is, this is the general sort of bound that you might think you can prove for, for uh, zero density estimates. And then there's a pretty well-known, pretty standard argument. Um, so I, I take my summatory function of the von Mongold I turn this into some sort of complex integral with Perron's formula. Then I need to shift some contours and this gives me zeros from, from the poles. So if I use some bounds for N of sigma T, if I use the best known zero free region, this, this vinaigrette of Korobov zero free region, um, there's sort of a standard way to do this. And this lets me find primes in a short interval like this. And the, the length of the short interval is a little bit larger than X to the one minus one over A. So we see that the constant showing up in the exponent of the zero density estimate directly affects the length in which we can find an asymptotic for primes. Okay. So there's a hypothesis. This is the density hypothesis. And this says that the constant A equals two is acceptable or admissible. Okay. And if you think about what's happening at sigma equals one and sigma equals a half, then you can see that as a linear function, then two would sort of be the best you could hope to do. Uh, so this is the density hypothesis. It follows from uh, the Lindelof hypothesis. And if you assume the density hypothesis, then this lets you find primes in short intervals when the length of the short interval is, again, just a little bit larger than the square root of x. 
maybe x to the epsilon larger than x to the one half. So this is almost as good as what the Riemann hypothesis gives you. Riemann hypothesis gives you square root of x times some logs, perhaps square root of x times some small power of x. But this is almost as good as Riemann hypothesis under this weaker assumption, just using some zero density estimates. OK, uh, so that's what we think maybe should be the case if you don't go the whole distance to RH, but maybe some distance towards RH. Uh, the best unconditional density estimate is due to uh, two different people and you combine them together uh, due to Ingham and Huxley. And here the bound looks like this. So it's the same general shape. And now the constant A is 12 over five. Okay, so 12 over five is 2.4. This is something bigger than two, but you can prove a bound like this and this is unconditional. Okay, so by what we just talked about, we have this, this one minus one over A business. This lets you prove an asymptotic formula for primes and intervals of length X to the seven twelfths plus a little bit. Okay, for your convenience, I've written out X to the seven twelfths a couple decimal places. Okay, so it's, it's close to X to the one half. Not, not all the way there, but pretty close. Um, and this is essentially still the best known result for um, an asymptotic for primes and short intervals. There's, there's some work of Heath Brown where he can basically remove the epsilon. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so Ingham proved his result in 1940, so quite a while ago, and he proved a bound of this shape. Uh, so you always have the one minus sigma, that's sort of always floating around there. So then the three over two minus sigma is, uh, think about that as this A factor. And then Huxley about 50 years ago, building on work of Halas and, and Hugh Montgomery proved a bound of this other shape. Okay, so don't, pay, don't worry too much about what these constants are, what this all looks like, uh, but they prove bounds like this. And if you combine them, you get this, this Ingham Huxley bound. Okay, so I'll, I have a picture here on this slide. This is some high quality uh, computer graphics here for your viewing pleasure. Uh, so, so I've plotted this three over two minus sigma and then the Huxley's three over three sigma minus one. And you can see that one of them goes this way, one of them goes the other way, and then they sort of meet at sigma equals three quarters. And at sigma equals three quarters, this, they're both equal to 12 over five. And this is where 12 over five comes from, okay? Uh, yeah, so that's, right. so that's how you get the 12 over five bound. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned, I mentioned some of the years, these bounds have been around for a very long time, okay? Um, so Huxley, he proved his, uh, result about 50 years ago. And since that time, there has been a little bit of improvement on density estimates when sigma is greater than three quarters. Uh, so for instance, we know that the density hypothesis actually does hold in some range of sigma where sigma is a little bit larger than three quarters. There has been some improvement there in, in this time since Huxley. Um, and then Ingham's estimate going all the way back to 1940, and Ingham's estimate is superior when sigma is smaller, when sigma is less than three quarters. Um, there's basically been no improvement for, for more than 80 years. Okay, so we're still essentially stuck in the same place. Maybe you can refine some of the, you know, the T to the epsilon factors or, or reduce the power of log or something like this. But essentially, um, Ingham still has the best result. And the main difficulty is that we don't have any good bounds for higher norms of the zeta function. Okay, so we've, we've seen in several talks how uh, we have the first moment, or we have the second moment and the fourth moment, and uh, this is, sort of puts a ceiling on how much we can we can try and prove. Okay. So this is this is essentially the main difficulty in trying to get anything better. Okay, uh, so we could play a game though. We could think, okay, uh, what if I yeah? On the previous slide, do you mean you need asymptotics, or you just need like the full main term for these upper bounds? Because we have. Oh, sorry, we're doing everything unconditionally. Is that the idea? Yes, yeah, so we want, yeah, trying to work unconditionally. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so maybe this 12 over five constant is is tough to improve. Um, we could still think about what what would what could we try and do if we wanted to try and improve this result. And if we go back to this picture, you can see that actually, if sigma is a little bit away from three quarters, we would get a better constant. If I can move a little bit to the left, I'm actually dipping below 12 over five. If I move a little bit to the right, again, dipping below 12 over five. So it's only right here when sigma is very close to three quarters that this constant can't be improved. So if you look at this uh, Perron's formula argument that I was talking about before, and you look at the sums over zeros that show up, 
you would maybe get something like this. And this would be a problematic zero sum that you would want to try and understand. Um, so if I wanted to get an asymptotic formula for primes and intervals a little bit smaller than x to the 7 twelfths, I'd have to be looking at zeros with real part very close to 3 quarters. Their ordinate is going up to something a little bit larger than x to the 5 twelfths. And maybe there's some way we can find cancellation in the sum. Okay, so again, none of these zeros actually exist, but if we sort of pretend that there are lots of them, then maybe they would be pointing in different directions. Maybe there was, maybe there's some way you could get some cancellation and, and you could prove a result like this. Um, a difficulty is that there are some situations that you would have to try and rule out, show that those don't actually occur. Uh, so for instance, it's awfully possible that there are lots of zeros in this sort of vertical arithmetic progression. Okay. Of, of course, this is like completely absurd. This shouldn't happen, but maybe it does. And if there are lots of zeros in this vertical arithmetic progression, then there won't be any cancellation, right? All the angles are sort of pointing in the same direction and you won't have any cancellation. Okay, so vertical arithmetic progressions of zeros would be a barrier to, to trying to attack the problem along these lines. Okay, so maybe here, I don't know if this is a coincidence. I don't know if there's something deeper here, uh, but this has a little bit of similarity to what um, Hugh was talking about in his talk on Tuesday, where a sequel zero like forces the, you know, certain other zeros of L functions to be in arithmetic progression, things like this. I'd be very interested if anyone has ideas about maybe some deeper connections here. But the takeaway is that vertical arithmetic progressions of zeros um, are sort of messing things up. Yep. Infinite arithmetic progression or just big in arithmetic progression for some length? Yeah, so here I said, you know, n going up like x to the 5 12. So, um, so if, I'm, if I'm trying to find primes in a short interval, I have to take zeros up to some height. And then I sort of don't care what's going on above this height. And if the zero is up to this height, a little bit more than x to the 5 12. If those zeros were all in an arithmetic regression like this, that would be, that would be a problem. Does that answer your question? Okay, maybe we can talk later. Okay. Okay, uh, so to give to set the stage, set some context for what I'll be talking about later, I just want to review how these classical zero detecting methods go, because we're going to do compare and contrast later on. Um, and the basic philosophy is pretty simple. So if you have a zero off of the critical line, this should give rise to a large value of a Dirichlet polynomial. A large value would be something like maybe a constant size. Uh, but if you believe in some sort of like philosophy of square cancellation, then a Dirichlet polynomial should not have large values. They should have square cancellation. They should sort of be small all the time. So a Dirichlet polynomial shouldn't have large values. Or if it does have large values, this should happen only rarely. There would be some sort of conspiracy that would have to happen. So I could bound the number of zeros off of the critical line by counting how often a Dirichlet polynomial could take large values. And this is how this goes through large values of Dirichlet polynomials. Okay, so I'm about to throw some technical stuff at you. Um, just sort of let it wash over you. Don't take notes if you don't want to, that's fine. This is recorded, you can look at it later. Uh, so I have some parameters. X is T to the epsilon, Y is T to the half. And then I, and then I say, okay, look at this sort of unmotivated integral and have this complex integral, have this Dirichlet polynomial with the Mobius function. Maybe you should think about it kind of like a mollifier. Okay, so I have this complex line integral. It depends on this, this hypothetical zero row off of the critical line. And there's two things you could do. You could either expand this out as a Dirichlet series, or you could move the line of integration, right? This is always the game that you play when you have these complex line integrals. You see what you can do. Um, so if you move the line of integration, the fact that rho is a zero is going to cancel out some kind of hole. This will be very helpful. And on the new line of integration, everything is sort of easy and fine. Okay. These are the, these are the called, uh, called the type two zeros. Okay. And this, this is sort of standard nomenclature here. Okay. So maybe, maybe that part is fine. Um, and then I could also expand this out as a Dirichlet series. So if I expand it out as a Dirichlet series, then this is going to give a large value of a Dirichlet polynomial. Okay. These are the so-called type one zeros. Um, it's sort of standard in the theory here. Okay, so again, don't, don't pay too much attention to this. 
Uh, but I have some sort of coefficient. It's like a divisor sum with the Mobius function. And the reason you put this in is because it makes the first few terms equal to zero by, by Mobius inversion. Okay, so the first few terms are equal to zero. That means that the Dirichlet polynomial only has sort of large terms. It's only supported on larger n. And this will make it rare for it to have a large value. Okay, so then I play some games with the dyadic decomposition, some pigeonhole principle, whatever. And I want to look at Dirichlet polynomials like this. So I've called this D sub n of rho. And we'll, we'll be coming back to this, coming back to this later. Uh, something really important about Dirichlet polynomials is their length. And we, we've seen this in other talks as well, um, that uh, the length of the Dirichlet polynomial really controls how well or uh, determines sort of the limit of the techniques that we have. If a Dirichlet polynomial is short, we can take lots of moments and we can sort of control it very well on average. If a Dirichlet polynomial is long, then this starts to bump up against the edge of our techniques. Okay, so n will be the length of this Dirichlet polynomial. And n is running maybe between t to the epsilon and the square root of t. Okay, so I have these Dirichlet polynomials. They're taking large values and they have some length. And some, some, uh, a feature of these large value estimates for Dirichlet polynomials is that they're quite sensitive to the length of the Dirichlet polynomial. Okay. Um, so what I could do is I could have this Dirichlet polynomial and I could take powers of it. If a Dirichlet polynomial has a large value, then the square of the Dirichlet polynomial will also be large at the same place. So I could take powers to maybe try and make the length something a little more convenient. Uh, in any case, whatever you do, you're going to end up looking at something like this. Um, some average of the Dirichlet polynomial over a set of points. There's standard ways you can move from discrete averages to continuous averages. So maybe I'm going to look at some kind of integral of a Dirichlet polynomial. And then you have tools like uh, the Montgomery Vaughan mean value theorem for Dirichlet polynomials. Or alternatively, there's this Halas Montgomery Huxley large values estimate. So there's sort of standard things that you can do to, to control how often your Dirichlet polynomial is large or to bound the Dirichlet polynomial on average. Okay, uh, so this is all essentially standard. Again, if you didn't really understand this, don't worry too much about it. But one key takeaway is that vertical distribution of zeros plays no part in this whatsoever. Okay, so we had these vertical arithmetic progressions of zeros that I mentioned earlier. And this, um, this whole set of techniques somehow doesn't see any of that. Okay, we're only really looking at a horizontal kind of distribution of zeros there. Okay. Is there a reason why you did proportional um, Yeah, so, uh, okay, let me say maybe a little bit more about a convenient length. So if I wanted to, um, okay, so the sort of standard thing is this Montgomery Bond mean value theorem. And, for, and the most efficient regime for that is when the Dirichlet polynomial has length t. So if like, if the polynomial has length t to the uh, one half, and I take the fourth power, then this is like the square of a Dirichlet polynomial of length t. And this is like the most efficient regime. Yeah. Uh, but the, there's all sorts of other um, condition, uh, other ends you would have to consider. So maybe this gets to the remark at the bottom of the slide that there are some inconvenient lengths for which this like taking powers thing doesn't really work that well. Uh, so for the Ingham Huxley bounds, uh, when sigma is close to three quarters, these inconvenient lengths are about t to the two fifths. Okay. And, and this is, and the mean value theorem, the Halas Montgomery Huxley large values estimate is sort of like a little bit inefficient here. Okay. So large values of Dirichlet polynomials, um, the tr classical techniques really don't have anything to do with the vertical distribution of the zeros. Uh, but there's another circle of ideas for constructing zero detecting polynomials, maybe a little bit less well known. Um, this goes back to unpublished work of Heath Brown, maybe in like the late 1970s, early 1980s, um, some work of Bala Subramanian and Ramachandra. And then more recently, maybe about eight years ago, work of Conry and Ibanez. So let's talk about this because this will be um, our jumping off point for what James and I are, are doing. Uh, so we'll try and construct a different kind of zero detecting polynomial. So maybe I'll let little w be some compactly supported smooth function, something just really nice. And I have a parameter y greater than zero, which will control the length of the Dirichlet polynomial. Okay, so I'll define this Dirichlet polynomial s sub y. Uh, 
Okay, and I have this von Mungold function in here. And this looks really nice. We know what to do with sums like this. I can use mel and inversion to turn this into some kind of complex line integral. I could shift the line of integration to pick up contributions from the book. Okay, that, that whole story. Uh, so I'll write capital W to be the Mellon transform. And then the sum will look something like this. Okay, there's gonna be maybe some other contribution from a pole of the zeta function at one from like the new line of integration. Let's sort of forget about all of that. So maybe this Dirichlet polynomial looks like a sum over zeros. Looks like a sum over zeros, uh, non-trivial zeros of the zeta function. Okay. Um, since W is nice, then the Mellon transform has bracket decay. So we're really only going to be picking out zeros that are close to this point S where we're evaluating the Dirichlet polynomial. And if S itself actually is a zero, maybe I'll call it row naught, then the sum will look something like this. The, the row equals row naught term would give me a W of zero. And then I'd be summing over all the other zeros that are sort of close by, but not actually equal to that zero. Okay. So I'm just looking at zeros. That are, that are small, or, or, or sorry, the distance between row naught is small. Okay. Um, and now you can ask, okay, well, what happens here? What, what do the zeros around row naught look like? So there's all sorts of things that could happen. Uh, so for instance, row naught could be a quote unquote isolated zero, and maybe there are no other zeros close by. Okay, and I'm gonna have a picture of this on the next slide. Uh, maybe row naught has no other zeros around it, so that this sum over row is actually empty. There's nothing there. There are no other zeros. In which case, the Dirichlet polynomial would just be basically this W of zero, which is like constant size. And this would, this would be a large value for the Dirichlet polynomial. Okay, so I could take Y to be something like T to the epsilon. So this would be a very short Dirichlet polynomial. And then this technique of taking powers to get a convenient length is very efficient when I have a short Dirichlet polynomial. So if I could get a short Dirichlet polynomial like this, then I could essentially prove like a density hypothesis bound for these kinds of zeros, for these isolated zeros. And this is more or less what Heath Brown does in this unpublished work I mentioned earlier. Okay, so let's just look at a picture here. So this, uh, this black cross, this will be the isolated zero just sort of hanging out by itself. And then in the D-shaped region where, where it's all white, uh, there's no zeros there. So this black X is the only zero. And then maybe in like the blue sort of slashes outside, maybe zeros can sort of live out there, but they're far away from this, this given zero. Okay, so is that clear what an isolated zero kind of is? Okay, so if you had a zero that looked like this with no neighbors around it, then you could get a really good count for how many zeros there are, something approaching the density hypothesis. Okay, uh, well, that's pretty extreme, assuming that there are no zeros close by. So you could say, okay, well, what happens if there are only a few zeros around? Maybe I'm allowed to have a couple zeros kind of close, but maybe not that many. And if there are only a few zeros close by, then you can think about using something like a Turan power sum kind of argument. So the Turan power sum method, um, so you sort of have like a parameterized family of exponential sums. And this will tell you un under certain situations that one of these exponential sums has to be not too small. Uh, so you could try and play this sort of game with the zeros. This would be like varying my parameter y, and maybe for some parameter y, I can make all of I can make this sum over zeros to be kind of big, and this would give me a good contribution here. Uh, so this is more or less what Balasubramanian and Ramachandra do, and also Conrina Banyas with some with some refinements. Um, so these so these power sum methods they do work, but again only when there's not that many zeros close by. So if there were about log t zeros nearby, I'm thinking about maybe my zero living at height capital T. If there's about log t zeros nearby, then the power set methods aren't going to work. This is too many neighbors for this method to handle. And since there's about log t zeros in any unit vertical interval, maybe this is some sort of typical case that we should have to worry about. Okay, so there would be too many zeros for the traditional power some kind of methods to handle. Okay, and then even worse, there are situations where the zero row naught will have about log t nearby zeros. And then there's absolutely no value of y that we can choose where the sum is going to be large. And again, the enemy is going to be vertical arithmetic regressions of zeros. 
So if I have a vertical arithmetic progression of zeros with common spacing like a constant over log t, and if I look at a zero in the middle of that arithmetic progression, then some sort of Poisson summation argument is going to give you can't, lots of cancellation in the sum over zeros. And this Dirichlet polynomial or the sum over zeros is going to be very small. Okay, but if we're trying to take the length of the Dirichlet polynomial to be small. So again, there's some sort of obstruction coming from arithmetic progressions of zeros, vertical arithmetic progressions. And this time, this obstacle manifests in not being able to get a large value of a Dirichlet polynomial. Okay. So again, the vertical distribution of, of zeros near any particular zero has a strong effect on whether or not we can actually try and prove something like this. Okay, so here is probably the most bad picture you're going to look at. This is supposed to somehow be indicative of a zero in the middle of an arithmetic regression. And in the middle, I have zeros going up and zeros going down. And, and this is the sort of thing where Poisson summation is going to give you lots and lots of cancellation. Okay, so this, this is bad. And we don't really know how to deal with things like this. Okay, so this does bring me finally to, um, to something in the title, half isolated zeros. Uh, so this is a, a certain kind of zero or a certain configuration of zero that we consider uh, for which this circle of ideas, these sort of power sum type ideas can be made to work. And I'll say something in words and then we're gonna show another picture on the next slide. Uh, roughly speaking, a half isolated or a zero will be half isolated if all the nearby zeros will either, okay, so here's my zero. And then all the zeros that are close by either have a uh, close imaginary, sorry, close real part, and, uh, and they can have larger imaginary part, but I'm not gonna allow any zeros to sort of live near the bottom. Okay, so let's go look at a picture that will make this a little bit clearer. Okay, so this is very busy, but again, this X right here, this is the half isolated zero. And maybe I'm allowed to have zeros in this column moving up this blue column here. Uh, I sort of forgot to write that on the slide, but maybe the width here is something like one over log t or log log t over log t, something like this. I'm allowed to have zeros going up here. And then maybe I'm only allowed to have zeros once I get a little bit of distance here, maybe log log t cubed over log t. Okay. And then in this little area over here, there shouldn't be any zeros. And then again, the blue hatch marks means I can have zeros outside of this again. Uh, but essentially, I'm allowed to have zeros above a half isolated zero, but then not around it. Okay, so this kind of makes sense what this picture is doing. Okay, so this is the main point is that we are gonna, going to allow sort of arbitrary configurations of zeros above a half isolated zero. So the bottom of the arithmetic progression is okay, but the kernel is not. Sorry, what was that? So your problem is if you had a bunch of arithmetic uh, zeros on the arithmetic progression, so from the bottom of the arithmetic progression, that's half isolated, but it's not. Yeah, that's right. So if, if I'm if I'm a half isolated zero, then there there are no zeros right underneath. So this doesn't really look like an arithmetic progression. There's some discontinuity. But if but if this was all an arithmetic progression of zeros, then some zero up here it does look like it's in the middle, and then we don't really know what to do. Okay, so here is the theorem. Again, there's some, some technical stuff. The, the main takeaway is that half isolated zeros have short zero detecting polynomials. Okay. Uh, so by taking advantage of uh, the, the vertical distribution that we are going to allow zeros above a half isolated zero, we can get a short zero detecting polynomial. And if you do get a short zero detecting polynomial, then as we said before, this will let you prove a sort of density hypothesis bound for these kinds of zeros. Okay, so, so we do get a density hypothesis bound for half isolated zeros. And uh, okay, and there's some technical stuff here, but the point is there's, there's a short zero detection. Okay, any questions on the slide? Yeah. What was the radius of this, this circle? Yeah, something like log t squared. Um, so, okay, so maybe going to the right over here, this doesn't really make sense. Because like, if I go a distance of, you know, one, and I'm already going to be in the half plane of convergence, but then maybe going down, I want to have a large space where there are no zeros here. Yep, hold on. All right, so um, 
leaning in this direction, you might say, okay, it's kind of cool. Um, the definition of a half isolated zero appears quite unnatural. Like I drew, had this weird picture with like this weird sort of horseshoe shape or something. It's not clear maybe why you should think that these are the, the sorts of things that you should look at, why these kinds of zeros would somehow be useful. Uh, and it turns out that half isolated zeros will be useful if we assume some extra structure about zeros of the zeta function. We're going to need some sort of rigidity in the real parts of the, of the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function. And if we assume some sort of rigidity, then we can get a conditional improvement to these long-standing Ingham-Huxley zero density estimates. Okay, so well, we introduced this hypothesis, which we call hypothesis F. So F should maybe uh, mean finite or something like that. And so here's this hypothesis that the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function lie in a finite number of fixed vertical lines. Okay, so this is the rigidity that I'm talking about. Um, there is some uniformity here. We could maybe take a growing number of well-spaced vertical lines uh, as, as t increases, but for simplicity, we just consider something like this. And it's important to note that even under this hypothesis, this hypothesis f, you still can have vertical arithmetic progressions of zeros on any particular line. Okay, so this isn't really ruling out some of these problematic things that we saw before. You can still have vertical arithmetic progressions of zeros, but somehow we're going to have rigidity in the real parts. And the theorem is that if you assume hypothesis f, then you do get an improvement to these Ingham Huxley zero density estimates. So before the constant was 12 over 5, which is about 2.4, and we can improve this to something like 24 over 11, which is like 2.18 repeating. Okay. So under this hypothesis F, this kind of funny hypothesis about zeros on vertical lines. Is there comments over here? Questions? Well, it's approximately 2.4. Okay. Okay. Are the basins organized by uh, vertical standardized regions? May I suggest that people are speaking take off their masks? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Here. So sorry, I, I couldn't quite hear your question, but you went. So if your uh, hypothesis F, the hypothesis F, I think you need vertical lines. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking, that, so can you replace those vertical lines by uh, like a small, like a spandle like regions, as well as at every height, all the way up to the is small enough? Okay, so, so I think, let me see if I understand what you're asking. You're asking instead of a line, maybe. Uh, replace lines by very thin rectangles, something like this. Is that what you're asking? Okay, I, I think that you could probably do something like that. But uh, again, it, it, the proof is already quite complicated. We just sort of focus on something very simple. But I think there are ways that you could try and relax some of these conditions. Okay, any other questions, comments, heckling that needs to be done? Pardon? Uh, okay, so so maybe all the zeros lie on the half line and like the three quarters line and the nine tenths line, something like this. No, no, just a just a finite number of fixed vertical lines. Do the distance between these lines should be some people? Maybe I'll put the line very close to So if the lines are fixed, then there will be a positive distance between them. That's sort of what we need. Okay. Riemann hypothesis is that there is only one line. Yeah, that's right. So that's why you should believe this hypothesis because it falls from the right hypothesis. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So would it bound depend on the number of lines, which is big two, for example? Uh, no, it's some, some, yeah, it doesn't really matter. No. So yeah. Would, can, can you motivate this, uh, this hypothesis? Because again, say in, in the case of zeros of uh, trigonometric polynomials, if you if you had an exponential polynomial, you can have uh, you, you have this dichotomy that either all the zeros lie lie on one vertical line, or the 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 real part is equidistributed in some hmm. in some uh, in some interval. So it's from from this point of view, this hypothesis seems. Uh, and if we think about the Riemann uh, the zeros of the Riemann beta function as some of such exponential polynomials, this hypothesis seems a bit unnatural. 
Yeah, I, I agree the hypothesis is a bit unnatural. Um, may, so let, at the end of the talk, I'm going to mention um, maybe some obstructions to try and, trying to remove this hypothesis. And then we'll see a little bit why this rigidity turns out to be useful. Um, so yes, yeah, so maybe hold on to the end and there'll be something. Was there, there was another comment or something over here? Uh, if the number of lines were to grow slowly, what would the dependence look like on that? Uh, it's gonna, the dependence will be hiding in this t to the rule of one factor somehow in some like kind of complicated way. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe unmute and ask your question or give your comment. I, I don't dare touch this, the computer. Is messed up, so. Hi. Yeah. You don't need that strong assumption. You don't need it. Just, just lines. Okay. Sure. Okay. So I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> okay. Uh, so so there is a corollary. Okay. So you, if you have some sort of improved zero density estimate, you'll get some improved result on an asymptotic for prime centered intervals. So instead of seven twelfths, you could get a thirteen over twenty four. This is just you know plugging this into the sort of standard argument that I mentioned before. And maybe I'll remark that this constant 13 over 24 uh, could actually be improved further, uh, but maybe I won't say any more about that. Okay. Um, and then let me mention very briefly some sort of more speculative um, results, even more speculative than this hypothesis F. Um, so the key, the key point, which we call clustering, is that if I have zeros on vertical lines, then there can't be that many zeros on any particular line to the right of the critical line by the Ingham-Huxley bounds, right? We're getting some sort of savings. There's going to be some power savings compared to the total number of zeros. Uh, so if the zeros occur on this line, then they're going to have to occur in clusters, and there will have to be sort of gaps between some of them. So you could collect zeros in clusters when they're close together. And it's very natural to ask, and we're going to talk much more about this in a, in a few moments, um, what happens if all of these clusters of zeros are very small? Does this rule out any progressions on the, on these uh, vertical lines? Uh, so, yeah, so you can still have arithmetic progressions of zeros on a vertical line, but I guess the point is that eventually, if you just sort of keep skipping along the arithmetic progression, eventually it has to end. And there has to be like a last zero, and this last zero will be a half isolated zero. Yeah, so there could, there could be very long arithmetic progressions. This would correspond to a very large cluster of zeros. Um, eventually, it has to end somehow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if, this, if these zeros, which again are hypothetical and they don't actually exist because of the Riemann hypothesis, uh, but in this sort of like alternate universe where these zeros could exist, uh, then maybe if they were somehow randomly distributed, then any particular cluster would have to be quite short. And then if any, any cluster of zeros was quite short, then you could get um, some stronger uh, some stronger results. Uh, so assuming hypothesis F, assuming that all the clusters are sort of small, you can get a density hypothesis type bound for, um, for N sigma T. And you can also get some sort of like quasi sharp bound for the fifth moment of the zeta function. So breaking past this, uh, this fourth moment barrier. Okay. Uh, so very strong assumptions, and then you get some, some nice strong consequences out of this. Maybe I won't say anything more uh, about this in the talk, though. But I'm happy to, to chat later if you have any more questions about this. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about some of the ideas in the proofs. What are the ingredients that go into this? In particular, how do you how do you get this short zero detecting polynomial for a half isolated zero? Because this is really the spark that sort of ignites everything. Um, so our work is unconditional in our in our paper. Um, just for the sake of simplicity here, I'll assume hypothesis F where everything is on lines and is kind of nice. Okay, so recall this zero step polynomial from before, this, this S sub Y. Again, it looks like this. And then if you plug in what we had before with row not being a half isolated zero, then basically all the zeros nearby just have to lie above. 
right at the start here, and then all the ordinates will just have to be going up. So, so maybe this sum will look something like this. So we would want to show that this kind of sum, this sort of exponential sum, would have a good lower bound for some choice of y. Again, I think about varying y in some region, maybe y between t to the epsilon and t to the two epsilon. And I would want to show that for some value of y, I can make this sum kind of large, get a large value of the Beer's exponent. Okay, uh, so this like Mellon transform, let's just sort of ignore that. Um, you can pretend it's like a constant or it's you know non negative, and maybe it doesn't matter that much. So, really, we're going to be looking at exponential sums kind of like this. Okay, so I have these real numbers theta. Maybe theta one should be equal to zero, which you could always do you know, by normalizing. And then they're going to increase, and I have all, capital R of these things. Uh, maybe the natural thing to think about is that R is about log t. So maybe I have about log t zero is close to my maximum zero. Okay, so, so there's some sort of improved uh, power sum estimate that you could prove and that I'll talk about. Um, so for any fixed a greater than zero, there's going to be some real t between a and twice a where this exponential sum is not too small, uh, maybe bounded below by some polynomial in R. Okay, so let's compare this with maybe what more traditional Turan power sum type things would give you. Uh, the Turan power sum methods give you uh, an integer t, so not a real t, but an integer t, maybe in some interval of length R, and then instead of a polynomial lower bound, we have an exponential lower bound. And this exponential lower bound is really the reason that you can't have too many zeros close by. Okay, so, so the key sort of ingredients to improving on traditional power sum uh, results are the positivity of the coefficients, right? So I have like a one sort of sitting maybe uh, right here in front of these exponential factors. So there's positive coefficients. And then instead of requiring t to be an integer, t is allowed to be some real number. And this gives us some extra, extra flexibility that we can use. There are, there are uh, like to run power sum results that exploit positivity of the coefficients, uh, but sort of not, um, not sufficient for what we're, the sort of application that we have to zero density estimates. Okay, so let's just um, discuss briefly some of the ideas in this proof. Again, don't be so concerned about um, the technical details, but just try and take away uh, the big picture ideas. So the first, uh, the, the main, maybe the main idea is to complexify the situation. So we want to plug in a real number t for which this exponential sum is not too small. And maybe instead of just looking at real t, we could look at complex t. So we'll define this function f of z. Uh, which is now this is going to be something analytic because it's finite sum of analytic things. And we're going to want to be plugging in complex numbers z that are in the upper half plane. Okay. Um, the key point is that all these thetas are non negative real numbers. So if I plug in things in the upper half plane, then I can get some nice bound of f of z. Nothing is going to be exponentially growing if I'm, if I'm staying in the upper half plane. Okay, so I have some sort of nice upper bound. So f of z is going to be at most r in absolute value. And then on the other hand, we also have a pretty good lower bound. So remember I said that this, this first uh, theta value is equal to zero. So theta one is equal to zero. So if I plug in i a for z, and then uh, and then I look at all these terms here, the, the term r equals one will give me a one. And then all the other terms are non-negative. So I can just sort of drop those for a lower bound. So when I plug in Z is something purely imaginary, I get a lower bound of one. And the idea is to play, a, play this lower bound against some kind of upper bound and get a contradiction if there were, if there were um, a small value in every, at, along an entire interval here. Okay, so this is somehow the first main idea is that you can use complex analysis, which tells you you know, can tell you something about a point here by like what's going on on the boundary of some other place. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this F is analytic. So you can use some kind of version of Jensen's inequality, right? The usual Jensen inequality says something about um, the, the log of a function, an analytic function, like 
and at this, you can do, say something about that by looking at the boundary or an integral around the boundary of the disk. And then there's some sort of version of that for the upper half plane. So if I have a point in the upper half plane, I can get an upper bound on the log of the function by integrating with respect to some kind of measure, like some hyperbolic kind of measure along the real line. So that's the first, maybe the first step here. And then if you assume for a contradiction that this f of t is small along an entire interval, um, this will tell you that a big chunk of the integral is going to have to be really small. And this is maybe the other, the other important point, is that the interval a to twice a somehow has like a positive proportion of the mass according to this, this kind of measure. So if my function was very small on this whole interval, this is, um, this is going to have a really strong effect. Okay, so then you just do some very basic computations. Again, don't worry too much about the precise numbers here. But if f is small along this entire interval, then you get a strong upper bound on log of f of i a. Okay, something like this. And then on the other hand, we had a lower bound. This had to be at least one. We have a lower bound and upper bound. If you look at them, they actually contradict each other. If, you know, something is big enough. Okay. Um, so this is essentially uh, how you go about constructing a zero detecting column you know, for these half isolated zeros. So you use this kind of um, like harmonic analysis sort of idea. Um, these ideas are maybe uh, more common in harmonic analysis. They show up in like Hardy spaces, and maybe this is some sort of quantified version of the F and M Reese theorem. Um, these are just buzzwords I've heard. I don't know what any of this means. Um, okay. And, and versions of this argument were obtained independently by Wilson and, and Jean Bourguin. So some of these ideas have been around, uh, but we are going to apply them to, to zero detecting polynomials. Okay. Any questions before I skip ahead? Okay. All right. So I mentioned clustering before. So let's talk about clustering because this is probably the other sort of main idea and the other bit of structure that we're going to use here. So if we assume hypothesis F, then as I said before, I have zeros on lines to the right of the critical line. And these zeros will have to cluster somehow. And we can actually utilize this structure of zeros clustering up. Okay, so under hypothesis F, if I look at the zeros on any particular line, they have to come in clumps or clusters. And at the bottom of every cluster, there's gonna be a half isolated zero. Okay, so remember half isolated zeros it doesn't have any zeros beneath it. And then we don't really know what's going on with the rest of the zeros above it. Uh, so maybe how you should think about a cluster is I take a zero and then I go up a height like log t cubed. And if I hit another zero before I go up log t cubed, I'm going to add that to the cluster. And then I start at that zero and I go up another log t cubed. And I just keep going up until I run out of zeros or if I, or I go up and, and I don't find any zeros in this log t cubed distance. And then that would be sort of the cluster. And then you find the next zero higher up and you start the whole thing all over again. Okay, so there's some sort of way you can make this precise and technical. Um, and you can put all the zeros on the line into a cluster. So let's look at a picture here. So this is supposed to somehow represent clusters of zeros on different lines. So the red X's will be half isolated zeros. Again, these are zeros that have sort of a large gap underneath them, but they're allowed to have zeros above them. And then the blue X's are just any other kind of zero that live on these lines. Okay, and this is some, somehow supposed to convince you that zeros are going to cluster, and um, it can be fairly arbitrary what they're doing, but the main point is that clusters will always have a half isolated zero at the bottom, and we can use this. Yeah. How do you decide on how long a cluster is, this log t cubed? Uh, how do you decide that that's the cutoff for a cluster? Yeah, so that just has to, so the log t cubed, it just has to be bigger than um, so in this picture a long time ago where I had the half isolated zero, there was like a distance of like log t squared that I had to go beneath where there were no other zeros. So log t cubed somehow just has to be a little bit larger than that. Yeah. So what can you use log t? For multiple zeros? Um, so we don't really take any advantage of multiple zeros. Maybe there's some to be had. Um, for what we're doing, they don't really cause any issues just because in any, um, you know, vertical interval of length one, there's like log t zeros. 
And this somehow multiplies all the final bounds by a log or power of log or something. So it doesn't really affect what we're trying to do. Yeah. So there's a bijection between half isolated zeros and clusters. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So every cluster has a half isolated zero. Yeah. So maybe this is um, the next thing that we want to say is that there are few half isolated zeros, right? They satisfy a density hypothesis. And every cluster has to have a half isolated zero at the bottom. So there can only be, you know, kind of a few clusters. And then this, um, this leads to a sort of dichotomy argument, I guess, which is that if a cluster is short, then there's already not a lot of zeros there. Okay. And if a cluster is long, then maybe now I have lots of zeros sort of tightly clumped together. And this is some extra structure we can try and use. And we can leverage the traditional zero detecting methods that I was talking about earlier. We can marry all these things together and get some improved results. Okay, so that's sort of qualitative. Let me just give, uh, make this slightly more precise. So we'll need to introduce some sort of parameter H and this like keeps track of how many zeros are in the cluster. And as I said, every cluster has a half isolated zero. So if I look at clusters that have about H zeros, then I get this, this kind of bound on the cardinality. And this would be an improvement if H is small. Right, compared to Ingham and Huxley, because there's some room between the density hypothesis and the Ingham Huxley bounds. Okay, so if H is kind of small, then maybe I just need to use the fact that there are a few half isolated zeros. And then if H is large, I'm going to use the fact we have lots of zeros together in a short interval, and we can we can utilize this. Okay, so maybe I'll uh, just put up an example kind of slide here or an example result. Uh, so we need to count zeros by the real part sigma and then by the length of the cluster in which they live. So this is this H. And then also all of these zeros are detected by one of these traditional zero detecting polynomials. And that, that has some length N. We also need to keep track of this N. Okay, so you like do some sort of pigeonholing dyadic something and you keep track of all of these parameters. And you can, you can prove a result like this. This kind of lemma gives an upper bound on how many zeros can live in, in clusters of this type be detected by this kind of polynomial. And maybe the main takeaway is this factor of H in the denominator. This is what you win compared to um, the traditional uh, approach. So if I just use like the mean value theorem for Dirichlet polynomials, I'd maybe get the same bound, except I wouldn't have this H in the denominator. Okay, so you're winning this factor of H here. So if H is a little bit big, then this is winning you something a little bit more. Okay, and I'll say a few words about the proof. Uh, the idea is that, okay, so I have this, uh, this T here, DNIT. So every time I, I find a zero, that gives me a large value of the Dirichlet polynomial. Okay, so that's, that's what this DNIT to the fourth is supposed to be. But then also, this zero lives in a cluster. So I could start at this zero and then sort of walk along to all of its neighbors that are within about H. And every time I walk from this zero to the other zero, I can also pick up a large value from this other zero that's close by. Okay, and this leads to this kind of double integral. And if I look at this double integral, use some, again, some sort of mean value theorem for Dirichlet polynomials, this leads you into some sort of Diophantine counting problem. Okay, so it's like looking at how many ways can I write a product of zero, a product of numbers as a product of other numbers, but there's also some short interval condition kind of thrown in. Okay, so you, so you can figure out what this is. You can get some sort of bound on the number of, uh, the number of solutions to this, and this gives you uh, the result of this lemma here. So again, maybe the main takeaway is that if I have clusters of like H and H is a little bit big, then by any particular zero, there's going to be lots of other neighbors. And this is some extra structure that you can try to use. Okay, um, I'll just say something very briefly that you also, we also need to use some ideas coming from Heath Brown's 12th power moment. So in like the late seventies, he proved a bound, not a sharp bound, not like the T to the one plus epsilon bound that we would hope for, but he proved a bound for the 12th moment of zeta that is actually still quite useful, even if it's not sharp. And we can utilize some of these ideas essentially because the coefficients of these zero detecting polynomials, like they're not smooth, I have this Mobius function, but they're maybe almost smooth, right? You could think about um, interchanging the order of summation and then maybe the inner sum kind of looks smooth. I could relate that to the zeta function. 
And then if I look at the zeta function, if I look at the mean square on a short interval, this can be controlled with exponential sums. And then if I'm averaging over all sorts of different short intervals, I can bound these exponential sums on average. Okay. So either you've seen this before and this is not, not that interesting or you have seen it or you haven't seen it before and you don't know what I'm talking about, but, um, but there's some, some other ideas, maybe not, uh, not the traditional like mean value theorem for Dirichlet polynomials. We can also use some exponential sum ideas. And this also will give you some other kind of clustering result. You can modify this to work with zeros and clusters. And okay, H to the fifth, ooh, that looks exciting. Maybe that's helpful. Okay. So let me, in the, like, the last couple of moments, let me just mention something about obstructions. Uh, so we do hope that some of these ideas can eventually lead to like new, stronger, unconditional zero density estimates. But there actually are some potential obstructions that we would have to rule out that we that we don't quite understand. And uh, and this is and these obstructions are the reason that we have this hypothesis f in the first place. Okay, so we call these potential bad configurations bows of zeros, and there there will be a picture, a badly drawn picture coming up soon. Okay, so here's how you should think about a bow of zeros. Um, so you have to think about in two directions, what the zeros are doing vertically and what they're doing horizontally. So vertically, it looks like an arithmetic progression of zeros. The zeros have a common spacing like one over log t or a constant over log t. And then the real parts of the zeros will vary smoothly and, and slowly, like they'll start on the half line, go off to some sigma, and then come back. Okay, so. So here I've written these xj's, maybe these xj's are consecutive zeros. And um, you can see that the real parts are changing like one over t to the epsilon. Okay, and then the imaginary parts look like something in an arithmetic progression. Okay, so, so that looks nasty. Here's a picture, which looks maybe also nasty, but this is the basic idea. I start on the half line, go out to some sigma, and then come back. So, so this looks very weird. Um, but why is this? problematic for us. Oops. So here's the problem. Uh, so if I sort of look locally, if I zoomed in on any particular zero, then every zero, except for maybe a couple zeros at the end of a bow, where we're back on the half line, every zero looks like the middle of an arithmetic progression. Okay, the real parts are changing very slowly. So locally, they're, they're almost constant. The real parts are almost constant. And then vertically, I, I'm in an arithmetic progression. Uh, so this really seems to mess with the power sum kind of ideas. We already said that there's some sort of Poisson summation argument that's going to mean the power, this, the vertical arithmetic progressions um, are not going to be susceptible to a power sum kind of idea. And then the bow starts on the half line, and it's very short, these very short clusters of zeros. So it doesn't really seem like you can use these global sort of clustering ideas either. Right, so a, a zero detector at the end of a bow isn't useful since that on the half line, this is not a large value of Dirichlet polynomial. Right? Dirichlet polynomial on the half line can have like constant size um, valuations. And because the cluster is really short, this would only maybe improve bounds by t to the epsilon or something. And this, and this is of course negligible as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so somehow, somehow our whole like local global sort of strategy really breaks down when we look at these bows of zeros. Okay, um, and maybe the most interesting, interesting thing I want to say on this slide is that um, because of the bows, we really need this rigidity. And there's an interesting link here to a problem in additive combinatorics that, again, maybe some people have ideas about. Um, so maybe you would speculate that the only configurations of zeros that are bad is when all the zeros look like they're in an arithmetic progression or a union of arithmetic progressions. So like if I, if I have a sum over zeros and it's sort of uniformly small for all my parameters in some interval, then maybe that's telling me there's like some additive structure in the zeros. And this sort of feels analogous to like an inverse Littlewood problem in additive combinatorics. Uh, so there are some interesting connections here, but maybe I won't say anything more about that. Um, okay, and then I think I'll stop here. So thanks very much. Um, towards the end of your argument, you said you made use of Heath Brown's bound on the 12th moment. Do you know what would happen if you use the conjectures from the recipe, for example, here, 
what kind of effect that might have on the rest of your calculation? Uh, no, I don't. I guess I'll just say I, I don't know what would happen. That's a good question. Turan defined a good lecture as being one in, in which his name was mentioned. <laughs> so if I apply that rule to your lecture, from my perspective, this was a most excellent, it can hardly be more excellent lecture. <laughs> So I'm going to add some, well, a couple of historical points. I mentioned that I started graduate school in 1966 in Cambridge. Huxley was my office mate through all those years, and we attended the lectures of Davenport and Ingham. And that was la Ingham's last year of lecturing. He, we took two lecture courses from him, one on Berlin crimes and one on uh, uh, Vinogradov's exponential sum method. And then that summer when he was hiking in Switzerland, he died of a heart attack. So it was a big shock. Um, we thought he would be attending the number theory seminar in Cambridge for years to come. Um, I also mentioned in my talk that I was a member here in 7071. I had an office in the ECP building. That's the electronic computer project that was von Neumann's um, project uh, during the second world war. Uh, my I had an office mate in that building. That was Gabor Hollis. So, so both Huxley and Hollis are, are very close friends of mine. And, and uh, Huxley is still alive. I think he's a little, maybe in poor health. He still lives uh, near Cardiff. But, and and I, I, I exchange emails with him from time to time. Hollis removed himself from research because he couldn't, um, he had very high standards. He wanted to be as good as Turan, and he couldn't be as good as Turan. So, so he devoted himself to, to lecture, to un, instruction and lecturing to students. That's, that's what I have. Well, how smooth does, it, does this, um, this smoothness condition? How there are countably many zeros. You know, the, the bows of zeros? Yeah. yeah. For almost all sigma, there can be no zero. Almost all vertical lines, there'll be no zeros. So. Yeah, so I guess by smooth, so if you look here at this definition of these x of j's, you can see that the imaginary part is increasing by like a constant over log t, and then the real part is only changing by like the one over t to the epsilon. So compared to the vertical jumps, the, the real part is changing only a very tiny amount. So maybe that's what I mean by smooth. Yeah, you're right, it is discrete, so there's not like an actual smooth curve. So, so is there any relation to the question earlier about how, how slowly this bound could grow with T? You have a, a, a sufficiently slowly increasing bound on the number of lines to um, function with T. Uh, yeah, so you, you could have an increasing number of lines. Maybe you could have like log T over log log T squared. Uh, the wall space vertical line. There was one other thing I meant to mention. Uh, prior to my work on percorrelation, the only significant thing I contributed to analytic number theory was the zero detection method that you call classical. So I've now, I've now lived long enough that my early results are now classical. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I should have mentioned that uh, that's the whole type one, type two for a setup that does go back to, to you and his. Yeah, setup. prior to that, you only had Jensen's formula to you. Yeah. And, and, but Hollis had observed that large value, values of Dirichlet polynomials occur much more rarely than you, you would know from moments. Mm -hmm. And, but to use that, to apply that to zero detection, I mean, Turan and Hollis wrote a joint paper and they, they got a reasonable result for sigma near one, but, but for smaller sigma, it wasn't an efficient way to, to, to work. And so I had an idea. <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah, I should have mentioned that in the, uh, no, I, mentioned your name one more time and made it even more excellent. Yeah. <laughs> it took me too many times over it. So. <laughs> Uh, it was a lot of fun. I think he also said uh, traditional rather than classical. 
<laughs> I think he also said traditional rather than classical. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know we need to be